everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Cypress Institute's new webinar series. This is an extension of our long-standing seminar colloquia series featuring prominent researchers from around the world who address key questions and relevant topics. Today, for our inaugural session, our speaker is Professor Jean Ciar, Director of KRC, the Climate and Atmosphere Research Center here at the Cypress Institute. Jean received his PhD in atmospheric chemistry and physics from Paris de Dior University in 2000, following a postdoctoral position at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Germany, he held a permanent staff position at CNRS and LSCE in France, becoming CNRS Research Director in 2013 and leading an atmospheric chemistry group of 20 from 2012 to mid-2014. Since mid-2014, Jean has been a full-time professor here at the Cyprus Institute, where he's currently the director of KRC. His main expertise covers the experimental characterization of atmospheric aerosols and addressing issues related to their impacts on air quality, health, and climate. Today, he will be addressing um, the highly relevant topic of airborne transmission of the novel coronavirus in his talk, SARS-CoV-2 in the Air, a major route of transmission for the COVID-19 diseases. If you have any questions or comments during the talk, please submit them in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube, and we will have some time to discuss them, to discuss them after the talk. Now, Jean, over to you. Thank you, Marina, and good afternoon, everybody. It cannot be a pleasure to give this presentation, given the high number of deaths, more than 300,000 people so far in the world due to this virus. However, I believe it was important uh, to uh, give you a brief overview of the recent discoveries on uh, the virus, on this virus on the air, and uh, its possible transmission uh, of the COVID-19 disease. I started my research 25 years ago and spent a year on a small island close to Antarctica to study aerosols and their impact on climate. A couple of years ago, uh, after that, I studied aerosols in uh, urban environment and evaluated the impact of human-made activities on aerosols. Now I'm talking about aerosols that are not due to human-made activities, but are emitted by humans themselves. I could not imagine that once in my life I will have to deal with this type of, of aerosols. When I made this review of, of, of the SARS-CoV-2, I went through this very interesting document released by the John Hopkins University. It has been published two years ago, and it was uh, talking about uh, the potential global catastrophic biological risk, level pandemic pathogens, and its mode of transmission. And these authors concluded that this pandemic will most likely be respiratory and it will be contagious during the incubation period prior to symptom developments. Or when infected individuals show only mild symptoms, what we call asymptotics. It will have a low but significant case of fatality rate. Finally, the report continues its finding, noting that RNA viruses are the biggest threat uh, of such pandemic. And this is exactly what we are talking today about the RNA virus, SARS-CoV-2, completely fulfill all these points. I've noticed later in this uh, document that the, uh, the project team's preparedness-related findings have reflected eight key recommendations. One of them is improving surveillance of human infection from respiratory-borne RNA viruses should become a higher priority. And this rings the bell to me because I have been for doing for 25 years this type of surveillance in the air for all the types of viruses. The outline of my presentation will be as follows. I will give you a brief literature overview of what we have discovered recently uh, on airborne SARS-CoV-2. What is this virus? Do we have evidences of airborne transmission of the COVID-19? How can we model such human-to-human -human transmission? Which information is needed for these models? 
Why size matters for airborne SARS-CoV-2? What do we know about SARS-CoV-2 viability in the air? Can environmental factors influence this viability? The second part of my presentation will be about monitoring the SARS-CoV-2 in the air. What is done so far on bioaerosol monitoring? How can we, Cyprus Institute and collaborators, contribute here and take home messages? I will give you here, during my presentation, a lot of references of papers. They will be on uh, a black, um, a black reference at the bottom of each slide. What is SARS-CoV-2? SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The two represents the type 2 of the, of the COVID, of the SARS-CoV-1, which is the SARS that uh, appeared in China in 2002. Now, COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease 19, and the 19 represents the year where it was identified, which was last year, 2019. So don't mix up. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, while COVID-19 is the name of the disease that is caused by the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, talking about the genome of this virus, it's something like 96% similar to the bat coronavirus, 91% similar to the pangolin coronavirus, 80% similar to the SARS-CoV-1, 55% similar to the MERS, 50% for common cold coronavirus like influenza, like the flu. Coronaviruses have the largest genomes of any known RNA viruses with very low mut mutation rates in comparison to, for instance, the flu. And this is an important information uh, for the future, for immunization. Now we'll talk about a little bit of the characteristic of uh, the infection prog progression of, of, uh, in a in single patient. So when a patient is infected by the virus, there is a latent period of typically three days where nothing happens. After three days starts the period where the patient starts to be uh, uh, infectious. This last couple of days, and typically uh, for an interval of maximum infectiousness of four days. This figure has been very often used by my colleagues reporting what is air pollution, what is aerosols in the air. It gives you here the different sizes of fine sand beach, uh, human air, and what we're talking PM10 and PM2.5, which are the size of, of aerosols uh, emitted by uh, natural or human-made activities. And I, have, I wanted to show here the size of the virus by comparison. So if you take one small particle of PM2.5, and if you fill it with virion, virion is a viral particle of SARS-CoV-2, you may end up with as much as 10,000 virions in only one particle of 2.5 micrometer diameter. The SARS-CoV-2 have different routes uh, of transmission. Uh, first, you have here a person that is infected and that will emit droplets. These droplets have a typical diameter of five micrometer or more. They travel at few meters. They can <clears throat> infect another person directly through the droplet, directly by contact with the hands to the person, or indirectly if the droplets, they sediment, they settle down, and then the person touch this contaminated surface. There is another route that is due to aerosols. So very small droplets that are below five micrometer diameter that can travel much farther than one meter, and they can contaminate through airborne. And this is what I will be talking about today, the importance of this route compared to the others. Do we have evidences of airborne transmission of COVID-19? The answer is yes, and the answer is a lot. I will give you here just two examples that illustrate this uh, route of transmission. 
This study is, has been re reported very recently. It uh, illustrates the high attack rate of the virus following exposure during uh, a core practice. And uh, basically, you had an infected person here. And for a period of two and a half hours, you had 61 persons singing all together, very close to each other. And this person has contaminated 87% of the group which is 32 confirmed cases of SARS of COVID-19 and 20 probable secondary uh, causes. So a very high uh, infection rate here. And we are calling these events super spreading events of SARS-CoV-2. And there are many which are currently reporting in the literature. Another uh, example I decided to show you here is uh, something that has been reporting during the outbreak of the virus. Um, in China, and this is uh, during, uh, an, um, a, uh, it was at a restaurant in Guangzhou, and it was at the third floor of a restaurant, and this is illustrated here. All the round circle stands for tables. There was a total of 83 customers during this event. And if you zoom on this part of the room, this five table, A, B, C, D, then these are the different people who are sitting around uh, these tables. The person that is shown A1 here came from Wuhan and was uh, presented asymptotic. So she was contaminated and she contaminated 10 people in total. And however, she was not in contact with all of them. The people who were contaminated in this room were in other tables and they have never been in contact with this person. So in order to understand how they have been, able, how they have been contaminated, they ha the authors have tried to understand basically the airflow of their condition. Their condition was in this direction. So basically the person who was emitting aerosols of the virus here, the viruses was transported to the table B with the flow of the air condition. And then this flow of air condition was moving back to table C doing a recirculation process and contaminated two other people. This contamination happened for a period of almost one hour. So all these people, they were sitting next to each other for a period of one hour. It's a lot. And you have to understand that what happened here is that only 10 people, it's a lot, but maybe at the same time it's not a lot. 10 people out of 83 were contaminated. It's not that much people who were sitting next to the person who was contaminated did not show any uh, symptoms of contamination afterwards. So I've shown you here some examples of the possible route of transmission of the virus in the air. And now the question is, how can we model uh, such a human to human trans transmission? I will show you here another example from uh, Buenano et al. It's an infection risk model. So basically, I will explain you a little bit the, the, the rationale behind this figure. This is to simulate in a pharmacy of 25 square meter, where here you have the time in minutes, and here, basically here, the risk in percent of being infected. So for the first 10 minutes, there was a customer who was infected, who was not wearing a mask, and who spread the virus in the air by speaking, and then left 10 minutes after, 15 minutes after, another customer came in the same room, again without a mask, and then for a period of 10 minutes. The risk calculated to catch the virus during this period was ranging between, let's say, 2.5 and 1%. The different curves here stand, stands for the different types of ventilation. If you have a natural ventilation, basically no ventilation, then the risk will be higher, 2.5% risk. If you have a mechanical ventilation, so you increase the, um, the, the air renewal in the room, then the risk will decrease to 1%. So I wanted to highlight here this study. Why? Because you should not believe that there is 100% chance that you will get contaminated if you are next to a person. In fact, the risk is not that high. It's 1% to 2%. But still, it's important. Now, which information is needed for these models to be accurate? 
Well, these models are using, uh, using a quanta over time. This is this equation. I will not go into detail. But this equation uh, is using quanta emission rate, ERQ, which depending a lot of variables. One of the important variables here is the quantity of viruses that is uh, in, the, in, the, in the person that is infected and can release um, in the air. All this information here is related to aerosol uh, emissions from uh, human expiration. So I will show you a little bit some information about uh, uh, this data from recent publication. A recent paper from Toetal 2020 show that the virus load over time is strongly decreasing after one week. So basically, the person has a strong potential to infect contaminate people the first week, and then there is a decrease the few days after. There was a different paper with a different approach that was aiming to uh, evaluate the percentage of surfaces that was contaminated in the room of a patient. So a patient was closed in a room, he was, he was ill, and they have swab with a tissue, different surfaces of the room, and they have made an analysis of the virus. During the first week, they have found that more than 40% of the swab uh, they have done was positive. The following weeks, it was much less. Again, another proof that during the first week after the development of the illness, you are, you have a lot of uh, emissions of the virus and strongly decreasing the weeks after. This is very important information. Now, if you want to understand a little bit the characteristic of droplets that are emitted by human expiration, it has been evaluated for many years. So these are size distribution of, uh, of, uh, of droplets. Here, this is uh, the size in macrometer and here, is um, the concentrations, and this is when you cough and when you speak. Here are the numbers given by uh, this author, so it's not a new, th a new study. We have been uh, evaluating the emissions of people speaking for many years, and basically when you cough, you spread uh, droplets at the speed of 10, about 10 meters per second, and much less when you speak. The diameter is quite similar, about 10, 15 to 13.5 uh, 13, 13 to 16 micrometer. And um, the number of particles emitted per cough is, is between 1,000 and 2,000 particles of the time you cough. And when you speak, basically when you count from one to 100, you will emit as much as could be 6,000 particles. I've calculated that end of this presentation I will have emitted in this room 100,000 particles in the air. This is the view of, of the uh, droplets that are emitted. If you have cough, it's about 10 meters per second. Basically, it will fall after two minute distances. If you sneeze, the speed is faster and you may uh, reach for some of the droplets up, up to six meters. But if you have aerosols, they will not go very far. However, they will stay a long time in the air. And this is the reason why it's important to look at these aerosols. Now, these models, infection risk models, are looking at emission rates of the virus for different types of respiratory activities. Here, for resting, standing, light exercise, and for different types of activities like voiced counting, wishbone counting, speaking, breathing. In short, emission rate from uh, breathing while resting is about 10 quanta per hour. If you breathe doing while, while you are doing light exercise, you only emit three times more virus in the air. However, when you speak while standing, like I am doing right now, I'm sending 50 times more potentially viruses than if I breathe while resting. And it's even worse when I speak and I do light exercise, it's about 100 times more. So you understand why it's important to have a correct para parametrization of this information when you want to model uh, emissions of, of the virus in the air. Conclusion, silence is golden, of course. Why size matters for the virus? Well, we have indirect evidence of the presence of the virus in the air. This is a patient room 
and this is swaps, so collections of, of uh, deposit in different parts of the room, so the floor, the uh, bed rail, the locker, the cardiac table, the electric switch, the chair, toilet seats. All the time, all these parts uh, have been uh, detected with uh, some virus on it. And basically, they reflect what? They reflect the settlement of droplets and aerosol in everywhere in the room. What is interesting, however, here is that this air exhaust event can only be explained by the presence of aerosol in the room. So basically, it could not be deposition. And they have collected here on the grid of the exhaust a very large quantity of, of virus. So here, an indirect evidence of the virus in the air. Another direct evidence is simply, simply by sampling the air and collecting aerosols that are present in the room and analyze them for their content of the virus. This is here for two patients. Patient two shows here that uh, it has a lot of uh, viruses in the air for different size and for very small size. So equally, almost, for the big aerosols and for the small aerosols. That's very important information. And for an asymptotic person, again, some aerosols emitted in the air, although this person didn't show clear uh, symptoms. And again, a similar distribution with large droplets and very small particles containing the same content of virus. Now, why size matters? Size will influence the residence, residence time of airborne virus in the air. So basically, the amount of time the aerosol will stay suspended in the air. And there are some calculations, and you can get some numbers already. Basically, for an, for an aerosol that is five meter diameter, these authors have found that this aerosol in a static environment could stay, could stay about one hour in the air before uh, being deposited. But then if you look at different sizes, a four micrometer diameter would lead to, these authors have found 33 minutes in a one meter still air. But if you go to one micrometer, particles, so it's not big difference, four to, four to one doesn't look big. However, for a small particles like one micrometer, it's already eight hours in the air. So one micrometer, eight hours. That's the information you should remember. Another experiment that has been shown recently on TV is people speaking in a small box of 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter. And here is the count of particles over time that have been uh, settled uh, at the bottom of the 30 centimeter uh, uh, box. Again, it shows that when a person speaks loudly, uh, you have again aerosols and they are taking a couple of minutes to settle down in a very small box. Again, in a stagnant air, I don't want you to, I want you to imagine that what could be if you have some ventilation in a room, basically you respond in the air everything that has been settled down. Now, size is also influenced by the type of expiratory activity. And unfortunately, speaking, when you are speaking, it emits a lot of small aerosols, which are small aerosols stay a lot of time in the air. And basically, these results from different papers, not so recent papers, have shown that large emission of submicron aerosol when speaking. A very interesting paper that has been published a few weeks ago during the outbreak in Wuhan hospitals, was the size distribution of virus. Here, this is the size distribution. This is diameters of aerosol. So one micrometer diameter is here, 2.5. And here is everything that is below one micrometer. And this is the concentrations. Here, protective apparel removal room. So basically, the changing room where the medical staff, they remove their, uh, their clothes from the contaminated rooms. And basically, they have found that you have a lot of virus that is emitted in this room when the people they change. It means what? It means that these people have collected on their clothes some viruses and they have remobilized the virus when they were changing themselves. So they have basically transported the virus on their clothes from one contaminated environment to a non-contaminated environment and contaminated the environment by changing their clothes. This is very important for the protection of medical staff but also it shows something very important because the aerosols that are released are extremely small. And then if you look at the efficiency of the mask, 
then you will see that there is a problem here. The FFP2 masks that we are using now, which are one of the highest efficient masks uh, that is used, uh, is 95% efficient for aerosol diameters of 0 0.3 micrometer. 0 0.3 micrometer is here. So basically, it's here. So basically, you have here aerosol. You have here viruses that is smaller. And being smaller has a capacity to go through this FFP2 mask. Of course, I don't want to tell you the low efficiency of a surgical mask in this situation. It's even worse. What do we know about the SARS-CoV-2 viability in the air? And this is, of course, a very important information. This is currently the only study available on the viability of the virus in the air. It shows what? It shows that typically, and they have stopped their experiment in three hours, so they have no idea what happens after. But after three hours, they have noticed that they are the, it was a half time of, of the virus. So basically, you still have half of the virus that is viable after three hours. But this is the only study which has been reported so far. So it's not very robust statistics. Hence, this study has been done at 65 relative humidity. So there is a big question mark here. Viability of the virus for low relative humidity. Within indoor environment, we have dry air. What is the viability of the virus in indoor environment? We don't know, but we have some information for the first SARS-CoV, so SARS-CoV-1. And this, is re this result is presented here by Casanova et al, 2010. It shows here three curves. Here, the lifetime of the virus, this is the number of days, and here is the viability of the virus, 100%, 10, 1, etc. If you have 50% relative humidity, almost the humidity that was shown in the previous study, you have very short lifetime of the virus. If you go to a very humid or very dry environment, then the lifetime is extended. And you see here, you still have a viability of 10% after two weeks for this SARS-CoV-1. So this is very important information, and we're currently, we don't have it. Now let's move to the monitoring of the virus in the air. What's it done so far on virusal monitoring? We have a couple of uh, techniques that are used to collect bioaerosols. I will go very rapidly on them. You have the impinger technique. So basically, you collect aerosol and you put them here in a liquid uh, solution that will enhance their viability. You collect them in impinger system, like uh, impaction. You use cyclone to collect them at the bottom of the cyclone. Spore traps using gravity electrostatic precipitation, and filter, basic filter sampling, like your vacuum cleaner. It's a filter. And this is currently the most efficient to collect the virus. Why? Because if you use a Teflon filter, then it has a very high collection efficiency. You can collect very small particles, and then you are able to have a high collection efficiency for this virus. Now, Bioaerosol monitoring does exist already for many years, and this is an example of one of this uh, network, which is called Metasub. And the objective of this uh, network is to map the urban biome, molecular profiles of cities, basically public transportation, like subways, to improve the knowledge about the dynamics of their microbiome and the metagenomics profile. And this is the picture of uh, the sampling that has been done with this, this, this network, air sampling. So we have already some networks that collects in the air some bioaerosols and that makes some analysis of their content. However, there is a current limitation on this type of, uh, of uh, network that is reported by Coleman et al. Although baseline metagenic maps created by this story say a lot about, uh, basically about bacteria, it neglects to address the threat of weaponized or global catastrophic biological risk, what I have expressed to you before, agents, both of which would likely be aerosolized uh, or respiratory borne RNA viruses. So basically this network, they neglect to look at the viruses like the coronavirus, like the SARS-CoV-2. There is only one study that I have found which reports the existence of a network for virus, it has been done 
for a period of one year in the subway of Singapore with a portable biosampler here in a crowded place here. This is the results. I will not go in detail. It started from January 2017 to January 2018. And this is all the types of virus they have been able to detect. So some periods they could not detect, some periods they could detect. That's great. It shows that it's working, that it shows that you can detect viruses with this type of, of, uh, of system. So what can we do? We have a thought of uh, the possibility to deploy a bioaerosol for the virus, for the COVID, for the SARS-CoV-2. And we have called this project Air COVID Network. The objective of this project is to develop and evaluate the benefits of implementing an easy-to-operate bioaerosol network aiming at detecting the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 within indoor atmospheric environment. It uh, involves the Cyprus Institute for the bioaerosol sampling design coordination of the network, the Cyprus Institute uh, of Neurology and Genetics for the PCR analysis of the air samples, the Nicosia General Hospital for the Ministry of Health for the sampling qualification and clinical protocols, and the Cyprus Civil Defense Ministry of Interior for the support uh, in the operation of the bioaerosol network. So basically, currently, we are testing uh, the sensitivity of the filter units, validation of the extraction protocols. We are testing uh, our uh, systems uh, during clinical protocols at the intensive care unit of the hospital. We will be moving to uh, evaluating the, with a high resolution the distribution of the virus in patient room. This needs authorization from the Ministry of Health. And ultimately, we will be able to implement uh, a network of 10 stations within the, the city and operating for a couple of weeks to be used as early warning systems in environments such as shops, public offices, residential buildings, etc. Now, what is the added value of such network? Filter sampling is easy to operate. It means that this network has a high capacity to be transferred, to be duplicated in other places. It's cost-effective samplers, few hundred euros. Basically, you can build here a very dense network of tens, hundreds, thousands of sampling systems. It collects a high volume of air. So basically, you collect in one sample excels of tens or hundreds of people. So it has a strong integration capacity. It's non-invasive. It's uh, inconspicuous. This is great. By comparison, the swab test you are doing now with, um, with the collection in the nose and the throat is extremely invasive. So it has a great capacity of being non-invasive, which is a higher, capacity, higher cap acceptability sorry, for the population, and that is great. Now, it can operate, and this is the beauty of the system, non-stop for days, weeks, and months. So it's much better than the swab test you are doing, which is an instant picture of one day. It's great in the sense that if you run this test, this monitoring non-stop, then it can be used as an early warning system for new clusters. It can increase also the safety in working environments. You know that your working environment is monitored every day. You feel safe and you can work better. Now it has a low operational cost. One sample could integrate tens of hundreds of, of individuals and by comparison to swab test of one sample for one individual. Take home messages of this presentation. Airborne aerosol SARS-CoV-2 is now a well-established route of contamination for the COVID-19. However, we don't know the importance of this route compared to the others. This route, like the others, is likely to show a maximum of in infectiousness the few days before after the first symptoms. When you speak loudly, it was found to be a major source of SARS-CoV-2 in very small aerosols, which aerosols can remain suspended in the air for several tens minutes, even hours. And this has strong implication, of course, for contamination of, of people. Now, we have found very high concentrations of the virus in very small aerosols, especially in changing rooms of medical staff, suggesting that the virus could be transported and remobilized in the air in different places. Only one study is available to evaluate the viability of the virus influence of environmental uh, factors 
here remains a big unknown on, uh, that we need to address. Networks have demonstrated their potential to detect airborne viruses within indoor crowded environments. However, to the best of our knowledge, nothing has been proposed so far to enable a network to measure airborne SARS-CoV-2. The Cyprus Institute is currently testing the feasibility and added value of such network in Cyprus and Nicosia. The perspective of such network is the following. Implementing an indoor bioaerosol network within critical infrastructures has the great potential to detect at an early stage a large range of not only viruses but also bacteria and may prevent for their rapid spread within the population. These networks may be enhanced by new te technological developments, allowing, for instance, near real-time detections of bacteria and viruses. Such technology is already available, but never used for such purpose yet. I will finish my presentation by acknowledgement. I would like to thank the Cyprus Institute for supporting the Air COVID Network project, in particular, Michael Pekridas and the Cyprus Atmospheric Observatory team for their support in the, team, in the field, the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics for supporting the PCR analysis, and in particular, Christina Christodoulou and Jan Richter for their enthusiastic support from day one. The Nicosia General Hospital for hosting our sampling uh, there, and in particular, Dr. Lakis Palazis and Maria Foka for, from the intensive care unit for their continuous help in facilitating our field tests. I would like to thank also the Cyprus Civil Defense for the support in the operational phase of the network, and Mr. Haji Georgiou following us to engage the volunteers of the Cyprus Civil Defense in this project. Finally, the chief scientist, Dr. Uh, Mastadino Poulos, for his support in building the project consortium. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you, Jean, for this very interesting talk and this very relevant topic. Um, we only have time for one question, uh, which is, what is the reproduction, the mechanism of reproduction for the virus? Yeah, it's a big difference compared to bacteria and viruses. Bacteria can live in, your, in the environment. In fact, for instance, you may find a lot of bacteria in clouds because they can find food and water there, and they can be transported over long distances. A virus is a different story. A virus needs you to live, needs you to reproduce. If it doesn't have you, it cannot stay and reproduce itself uh, this way. So uh, you are the host, you are providing the food uh, to the virus. That's the way it works. Thank you for your answer, Jean. Thank and you very much. thanks again for the presentation. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, if you've enjoyed today, please don't forget to visit our website and our social media accounts to um, stay in touch with us and keep, tra keep track of our upcoming webinars. Thank you.